Welcome back. Uh, we've, yes. we've, that, that is absolutely true. We, we spent our first panel looking at, at the constitutional question uh, of what public use means and, and when eminent domain may be constitutionally permissible. Uh, and as we've heard, certainly under uh, present law and in most of the country, uh, eminent domain is usable uh, in, in quite a few instances uh, as state legislatures choose to use it. Um, but that also leads to the policy question of even if the eminent domain is an available tool, there remains the question of whether or not that tool should be used, whether or not it produces the benefits uh, that uh, some of its advocates uh, would, uh, some of the advocates claim. I'm going to uh, give a brief introduction to set the stage or, or perhaps uh, uh, in all candor, perhaps stack the deck uh, for this discussion. Um, after my remarks, uh, we will hear from three individuals who, who certainly know far more about this subject than I do, um, so you should pay more attention to what they say than to what I say. Um, uh, first, a after my remarks, uh, we will hear from uh, Jeffrey Finkel, who is president and CEO of the International Economic Development Council, uh, an organization that was formed uh, by the merger of the Council for Urban Economic Development and the American Economic Development Council. Uh, prior to that, he served as a uh, as uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Community Planning and Development at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, he also serves as the CEO of the National Association of Installation Developers. And one thing also worth noting in his bio, even though it is not, uh, may not be directly relevant to today's program, uh, he is head of the Bollinger Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that he founded to provide support to children who have lost one or both parents who worked in the economic development profession. After Jeff, we will hear from Sam Staley, uh, who is director of the Urban Futures Program at the Reason Public Policy Institute. Uh, and in the uh, debates over land use planning, smart growth, and the like, I think it's fair to say that Sam is one of the more prominent critics of uh, land use planning. Um, uh, although it is interesting, he is all, despite being a critic of planning and, and many uh, uh, current and, uh, urban development policies, he is also chair of the planning board uh, in his hometown of Bellbrook, Ohio, and a former member of its Board of Zoning Appeals and Property Review Commission uh, and chair of its Charter Review, Charter Review Commission. Uh, after Sam, uh, we will hear from uh, Tom Beyer, who is director of the Center for Housing and Research and Policy at Le and Levin College Fellow in the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs uh, here at Cleveland State University. And certainly for those of you from Cleveland, you are no stranger uh, to Tom's work. He has written frequently in the Cleveland Plain Dealer and elsewhere about uh, urban redevelopment issues that face our area and is certainly well known as being one of the more prominent advocates of the first suburbs or inner ring suburbs movement. Now the question that, that this panel is, is addressing and, and that we will be, be, be discussing is, is in some sense the broader question of how to encourage economic, urban economic development. How do we allow urban areas to redevelop? How do we enable them to experience economic prosperity, and even if there are no constitutional limits on, or, or few constitutional limits on the types of measures that state and local governments may take, from a policy standpoint, might there be certain tools that we should shy away from using uh, or use in, 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 in sparing instances? And in some senses, this is really a debate about the role of government in facilitating economic growth, a debate that we've already seen a taste of. There are those that believe that government should be the driver of economic growth. Planning, plan for economic growth should, as we often hear politicians say, grow the economy. And there are those that rather think that government should set the groundwork, lay out basic rules, and simply get out of the way. And this is not a debate that is unique to the eminent domain context. It's a debate we see in the context of land use planning generally, of various types of industrial policy and, and, and economic subsidies and other government programs. In the context of, of eminent domain, one way this debate, or one way we see this debate is, is a debate between those that believe that large development projects facilitated by government, large pro whether they are large mixed-use developments of the sort that was proposed in Lakewood, Ohio, uh, factories, malls, uh, as we've heard before, uh, Costco's or Ikea's, uh, and that, that is, whether or not these sorts of projects are the way to improve the tax base and create jobs and improve economic performance or whether or not the best approach is to have tax and regulatory policies that facilitate entrepreneurship, small business uh, creation, 
uh, and, and gentrification of neighborhoods in a more organic and piece by piece measure. I think it's fair to say that the political process, for a variety of reasons, tends to, to lean towards larger projects. Uh, projects that get a lot of attention, for which there is a clear political payoff, certainly are more attractive to political entities and political leaders than uh, the small, spontaneous order and creative destruction that we see in the market process. Uh, in Cleveland, we see this with repeated attention to projects like stadiums, convention centers, casinos, and the like, while there is relatively little attention to the, the way in which local regulatory burdens and local taxes affect things like entrepreneurship. The fact that for a restaurant to open downtown, it may require multiple duplicative permits of one sort or another uh, is, is not focused on, uh, but whether or, not, uh, 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 to, whether or not parking lots or other lands should be taken to be used for a convention center uh, dominates the political discussion. And the concern of some eminent domain critics, and I will confess that, that I am among them, is that the, more, the easier it is for local governments to use eminent domain, uh, the more this natural tendency of political bodies is reinforced. The easier it is for them to pursue the large projects, the projects that, at that, that attract headlines, uh, the more likely they are to use them. And if one believes that these sorts of projects are not the sorts of projects that hold the key to, to economic development in urban areas, uh, then this tendency is, is something to be concerned about. Uh, there is certainly a debate over whether or not, for example, the pole town development in the long run uh, helped Detroit, uh, and there's certainly debate about whether or not the sorts of eminent domain we see here in Ohio are in fact producing uh, the sorts of economic growth that we would like to see. In the study that Tim Sandifer mentioned uh, by the Castle Coalition and the Institute for Justice, uh, there have been, uh, between the period of 1998 and 2002 in Ohio, there were some three, over 300 threatened uh, uses of eminent domain for economic development, uh, some, uh, some 90 condemnations uh, to, to facilitate 30, 13 uh, projects uh, where the at least a substantial benefit was to private parties uh, rather than for public facilities. One can wonder whether or not those sorts of projects are producing the sorts of ec economic benefits and returns that their advocates claim. And at a time when, for example, Ohio has the has the third highest combined state and local tax burden in the nation, and on a recent ranking of economic liberty state by state ranked in the bottom 20%, some might think that focusing on large development projects really misses the boat in terms of what will allow areas like nor Northern Ohio and, and Ohio more broadly uh, to return to economic prosperity, job creation, entrepreneurship, and growth. Now, one question also is whether or not the individual projects themselves are going to produce the benefits that, that the advocates claim, as I've mentioned. It is interesting in the Kilo case, which we will be talking about more detail in more detail after lunch, some of the individuals that have filed amici brief, amicus briefs uh, have suggested that eminent domain is not as necessary as, as, some, would, as some would claim, and certainly some of my panelists uh, will, will say. Uh, John Norquist, former mayor of Milwaukee, for example, and president of the Congress for New Urbanism, submitted an amicus brief claiming that eminent domain is not necessary in many instances given the alternatives. And he gives examples such as the development of, of uh, Columbia, Maryland, um, a 15,000 acre development, uh, Mountain's Edge development in, in Nevada, a 2,400 acre development that was put together from lots, the majority of which were five acres or less, and the city place development in Palm Beach as examples of the sorts of large acre developments that can, be, that can, that can occur even without the use of eminent domain. Uh, other uh, uh, critics of eminent domain point to the revitalization of downtown Seattle and the Pacific and Pacific Place, again, where eminent domain uh, was not used. Another critic uh, who filed an amicus brief, and perhaps one that, that comes from a, a quite different perspective than, than perhaps the libertarian critique we heard in the earlier panel, uh, is the noted urbanist Jane Jacobs, author of The Death and Life of Great American Cities, who also submitted an amicus brief in the Kilo case uh, say, arguing that using eminent domain for economic development not only is not necessary, but in her view uh, is, is net harmful, that it produces economic and social costs, particularly in destroying uh, communities and organic neighborhoods that are not outweighed by the economic benefits of these projects. Uh, the last brief uh, that I wanted to mention that, that raises a policy critique of, of eminent domain is a brief that is submitted by, among others, uh, the NAACP and the AARP, raising the concern that, that given the nature of the political process and the bias towards larger projects, 
that eminent domain is typically used in a way that disadvantages and harms uh, those that have the least political influence in our society, uh, the, uh, whether that is minority groups, poor groups, or others that are politically powerless, and that therefore allowing eminent, the use of eminent domain uh, by state and local governments is going to have a disproportionate effect on certain communities. Now, whether or not these are, are grounds for changing the, the, the legal framework for eminent domain or the constitutional for eminent domain, uh, they, the, these and other re, uh, arguments may be reasons for reconsidering the, the policy preference for the use of eminent domain. As you can certainly tell, uh, I am one that is skeptical of eminent domain's value. Uh, I will now turn uh, the podium over uh, to Jeff Finkel, who uh, I can assure you uh, will explain uh, some of eminent domain's benefits and the projects that it has helped facilitate. Thank you. Good morning. I, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but the, um, the tendency to want to rebuttal is too great. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so I do want to make some opening remarks. And, and we seem to be getting lost uh, in this discussion today. And, and we, the, the thing that gets lost is reality. Uh, reality. Uh, Detroit, Michigan, population 1960, nearly 2 million people. Reality today, less than a million people. The area that was affected by Pole Town uh, was an area of blight, abandoned homes, uh, acres and acres of, of place uh, where people no longer lived. Three Polish churches, uh, and the federal government, in fact, was the funder, or a partial funder of the uh, General Motors facility. I happen to be working at HUD during the time that we developed that property. Reality, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, inner city, has the highest per capita amount of abandoned land uh, in the United States, over 15,000 parcels. Uh, to assemble those parcels, you're going to have people that say oh, the intrinsic value of their land is greater uh, than anybody would be willing to pay, uh, but they will hold out, and they will hold out, and they will hold out. Um, reality, we talk about these, uh, these uh, people, the substantial benefits to private parties. Actually, the substantial benefit is to the community as a whole. You take properties that are not generating anything and you're putting jobs there that are creating tax base, that are helping to pay for the police services, the fire services, the homeless shelters, and you are starting to generate some economic benefit that is far superior to the economic benefit uh, that was on those properties before this. Um, John Norquist, who was just uh, quoted here a minute ago, as mayor of Milwaukee actually used eminent domain. So it seems to me a little uh, uh, off base for John now that he's the head of the Center for New Urbanism to all of a sudden be an advocate that says eminent domain is no good when in fact as, as mayor and uh, he used it as a public policy mechanism to create jobs and communities uh, so that he could create tax base. Um, finally, uh, I, I would have to say, having uh, heard uh, uh, Professor Mar uh, Merrill speak in the, in the prior uh, point, that the alternatives in eminent domain are pretty draconian. And uh, if, you, if I take you back to the 1960s, we used to have a thing called urban renewal. So how did we behave in the 1960s when we had an area that was deteriorating? We went, down, we went through as a public use and we tore down everything. We, bl uh, we took these blighted areas and we, we took public dollars and we just wiped out everything in sight and we let it sit there. And then eventually, years and years and years and years later, uh, we might find a use. Today we are being far more thoughtful about the process and just going after specific properties from time to time as opposed to be as draconian as we were in the 1960s. Uh, let me go through some uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, to go quickly through the issues of, of, of economic development. IEDC is the, uh, uh, is the organization that does economic development uh, from the government and public-private partnership side here in the States. You all know by now what eminent domain means and you know that the U.S. Constitution allows it. It is a tool of last resort, uh, unlike what the Institute for Justice says. There are not people sitting in, in, in towers and cities across the country just waiting to use eminent domain. 
Uh, they want to see the, the, the private sector work. They want to see uh, uh, it is very expensive to use eminent domain. It is very timely to use eminent domain. Uh, but it is a, a, a power that the city uh, does have available to them. Economic development is, is used for the public good. It transforms and revitalizes neighborhoods. It brings businesses to cities and communities that they otherwise wouldn't have had. It allows for larger projects where the parcels, uh, individual parcels are not, are not great enough. What I generally refer to the people who argue against it is they are the believers of the Wild West. And, and the Wild West basically says we don't care about what goes on in inner cities or our cities. We don't care about the tax base. We don't care about the jobs in those communities. We can, uh, we can plow under Summit County. We can plow out places where there are, uh, are uh, large green fields out in the hinterlands, and that's where we're going to put our big projects. Because when a developer runs into an issue, they're not going to stay and fight. They're not going to uh, continue to stay in that place. They're going to go to the path of least resistance. And that means Geauga County. That means Lorraine County. That means uh, whatever the next greenfield site is that's uh, way outside of town. And then you're not supporting the police department, the fire department, the homeless programs in places like Cuyahoga County, which has a bigger portion of, of the urban poor. Um, it also supports such things as smart growth, improves the quality of life, promotes development with economic pr pr uh, uh, prudence. But at the end of the day, let me also continue to remind you, this is a tool of last resort. It does not get used that often. Uh, Jonathan, how many times did you say it actually got used in Ohio during the period of the time the Institute for Justice? Uh, um, Thir 13 projects, uh, 90 condemnations, and over 300 threatened condemnations. Um, I don't count a threatened condemnation. We don't know what that means. I don't think the Institute for Justice knows what that means. But when you look at it uh, from the actual use, that's a pretty, in a, in a, in a place the size of the state, that's a, a pretty thin use of eminent domain. Um, uh, we have done dozens of case studies. There are lots of, lots of real estate development projects uh, around the country that just couldn't have happened without the use of eminent domain. Um, let me give you three examples. Uh, Lakewood, Colorado. Uh, one of the problems with many of our first-tier suburbs, and, and Tom uh, can tell you uh, many of the uh, horror stories of first-tier tier suburbs, many of them are a place without a place. Uh, Lakewood, Colorado finally decided they wanted to turn a place into something and they decided to create a, a, a main street. One of the second issues that we find in many of these first tier suburbs and many of our central cities is in fact uh, that uh, we have too much retail space. Empty retail space is called gray fields and there are millions and millions of acres of gray fields. So uh, these are uh, abandoned Sears, Targets, uh, uh, Kmart's, you can uh, drive through almost any uh, uh, major route anymore and you can see empty retail. What uh, Lakewood, Colorado did is they negotiated for some of the property and then they had to use eminent domain to uh, acquire some additional empty retail in order to uh, create a town center and they have a very successful town center on their half, on their, uh, in their community. Uh, Ridgefield, Minnesota is now the headquarters for uh, Best Buy who uh, probably would have left the Twin Cities areas had the, and having a corporate headquarters is a major win for a community in terms of the jobs and the tax base that that generates. Uh, they used eminent domain in Richfield, Minnesota in order to uh, make the uh, 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 headquarters of Best Buy possible. New York City Times Square, if you were there 20 years ago, you would have been, uh, probably wanted police protection as you walked down the street. Um, unless, of course, you wanted to walk in and out of all the peep shows that were uh, in Times Square. Times Square today is a place uh, of, of a high quality development. It has a great number of, of new hotels and stuff. But this, this project would not have been possible without uh, getting rid of a number of the uh, uses by the use of eminent domain. Eminent domain issues and challenges, uh, meeting blight standards. One of the things that could happen in the Kilo case, if you threw out the baby with the bathwater, uh, they are not just attacking eminent domain for economic development purposes. What might, would likely happen is you would lose eminent domain for blight as well. Uh, this eminent domain serves the public good. Uh, they like to talk about using it for private sector purposes. The private sector is, in fact, 
they, they would also argue, are the ones that pay taxes, create jobs, and that is what uh, is trying to be accomplished when you use uh, eminent domain. But as importantly, and, and I think uh, Professor Merrill said it in, in his uh, commentary, is people do get paid. And in many cases, people do want to leave these neighborhoods where uh, eminent domain is used. They do want to have alternatives. Um, I ended up being on a national public radio program called um, uh, Justice Talking, and, uh, which will be aired starting this weekend. Um, and there were people in Philadelphia, and there was a major land transformation going on there. They were pleased to have their land taken by eminent domain so that they could move out of the slum that they were living in. They were given enough money uh, to go find a new neighborhood, uh, and the city is hoping to, uh, uh, to use this new, uh, new land and create new housing opportunities for people. Um, meeting blight standards, well, there are uh, standards of, um, all over the country. The, the way eminent domain is used is, is determined on a state-by-state -state basis. So it is difficult to uh, pin down uh, how eminent domain is w being used from, from one place to another. In, in, in Missouri, excuse me, the state actually turns over the power of eminent domain to a developer. Uh, unlike Ohio, which has greater protections, uh, you find that they uh, actually, once they've made a decision on a, a parcel and a redevelopment project, they have the developer actually carries out the eminent domain practice. Um, uh, as we've talked about, uh, eminent domain has typically been used for public projects, but ultimately, more and more, we're using it for redevelopment projects that allow for the rebuilding of, of cities. Uh, just compensation has not been an issue because that is guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, what the real issue in most cases is, is dealing with the holdouts. Uh, these are the people that have uh, what they view as a key parcel, and if the parcel on an appraisal basis would be considered worth uh, $400,000 and they ask $4 million for it, uh, just because they believe they have the key parcel, uh, should the community not have the large project, should they not have the jobs and the tax base, that, the, that that parcel and that project would provide. And that's where the courts have generally sided with communities, that in fact uh, there has to be a way of dealing with these holdouts that are trying to get onerous prices for property that isn't worth as much. Uh, what is funny about the Hathcock case, and you heard a fair amount of, about it during the uh, previous presentation, I was on the um, uh, panel at the Insta Appraisal Institute with the attorney from the Hathcock case. If you go to his website, uh, you know, he, this is an attorney that specializes in, in representing people in eminent domain cases. He had a case that he just took too far. And uh, he has hurt his business in the state of uh, Michigan as a result of, of pushing eminent domain to the point where uh, it is uh, now not going to be possible for him to represent clients like that because he, uh, in his uh, uh, zealousness of, of supporting his clients, he actually, um, all of his clients ended up not being able to sell their land, and it was about money. Uh, oftentimes when you hear that it's not about the money, it's about the money. I am, uh, uh, I'm done uh, with my presentation, uh, and I'd be happy to take questions a little bit. Thank you. So many things to say, <laughs> but not enough time. But that's uh, all the panelists, I think, will, will find themselves in that same position. Um, first of all, I want to thank Case Western Reserve University for, and the Federalist Society for hosting this event. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Because what we're doing with this panel is trying to go beyond the law and the narrow interpretation of the law, and really began to talk about cities and talking about redevelopment. I think that's extraordinarily valuable. And as Jonathan said, I am a, uh, I'm a critic, critic of eminent domain, and what I've found is over the years I've become an increasingly larger critic of eminent domain um, to the point where I've even become uh, a bit extreme in some cases. And um, in part that's because I've seen the way eminent domain has been used. And, it is, and it's bothered me. And I'll, let me give you a little bit of background from me, and uh, ho hopefully won't eat too much 
of my time. I, I assume I'm being timed, and so because I can't see the clock in the back, so at this point. Um, but I originally started over 20 years ago looking at urban development research, focusing on inner cities, trying to figure out how we could take my hometown ordinary decline. Um, and it, for all, it, it's heavily manufacturing. General Motors is a very important part of that town. And what motivated me was how do we try and get this city back to where it was when my father was growing up in some of the same poor, many of the poor neighborhoods of the city. And so this is an issue I have a lot of sensitivity to the problems that professionals like Jeff and the people he re and the, the groups that he represents to the problems they face in redeveloping cities. And I'm acutely aware of the, of the practical obstacles. The question for me, though, is whether or not eminent domain should be used. Actually, there are a number of different issues. I, what I like to do is, is really review three issues um, in the next few minutes. One is ask a normative question about when it should be used. The second is talk a little bit more about how it's used and why I think it becomes problematic from an economic development perspective. And then third thing I want to do is talk a little bit about um, some of the things we might be able to do to constrain its use to, into an area where I think it would be more proper. Um, first of all, I think we need to remember that the poll, uh, this poll, discussion of poll town aside, there's very little evidence that Detroit has improved much since 1984. And in fact, it still remains the test case for urban decline and the problems we face in reversing urban decline. And I think it's very important to understand that just because we are proposing a project of any sort, that doesn't mean that we're automatically going to get those benefits. There's a lot of uncertainty. In fact, there are a lot of questions within the professional and academic community about really what leads to the revitalization of neighborhoods and cities. And one of the things that I keep in my mind, actually this Cleveland is a great case, because while the city was investing hundreds of millions of dollars into the downtown and the gateway complex, you found investment was still declining in the neighborhoods. And I'll confess that my perspective on urban development is primarily a neighborhood-driven approach. Um, I believe that a healthy city it depends crucially on healthy neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods are not, are, are going to be, they should be diverse, they should be open-ended, they should be allowed to evolve, and the cities themselves should be allowed to evolve to, to different needs. And so I've been a critic of a lot of downtown projects as a result because I think they take us away from what I think are critical issues we need to address in the neighborhoods in order to stabilize those neighborhoods. And I think eminent domain, particularly when it's used for large projects, um, tends to actually weaken those neighborhoods. So in this sense, I am very sympathetic with some of the things that Jan Jacobs has, has argued in her books, um, as well as some of the new urbanists on many cases. But let me uh, talk first, uh, make the point that even though legally you may have a tool available, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to use it. And one of the points I want, I think we need to recognize is that eminent domain is a particularly harsh tool. I mean, what you're talking about is after, I mean, it's one thing if you want to sell your property. It's another thing when you don't because you've invested lots of time and effort into that house or in, a, in all sorts of reasons. And what we're saying is we're going to say we're going to take that property, even though someone has decided they don't want to sell, and we're going to hand it over to either the government or, in many cases, a private, another private property owner. So I think this has to be used in a sparingly cases. And I would disagree with Jeff in the sense that um, he thinks it is a tool of last resort. I've seen enough cases where it is not used as a tool of last resort. In fact, I've seen it listed as among the same tools at the same level of, of activity in, as loans, grants, tax abatements, that type of thing. In other words, it is on par with lots of other economic development strategies. And I think we need to constrain that. I think it, because of the nature of the power of the tool, it should be restrained. Now, let me, so I think there's that issue we need to, to focus on. And also another more important, uh, important point, and here I'm going to draw from, it's going to be a bit abstract. But I think one of the things we need to recognize from the larger knowledge, body of knowledge that we know about economic development, and this is true not only for central cities, this is also too, true for nations. This is true for when we're looking at why is it that Nigeria doesn't develop compared to, and why did the United States develop during the Industrial Revolution, and why didn't, for example, China uh, develop in the same way economically as we did. 
What we have discovered is that a secure system of property rights, what that means is you own property, you can dispose of that property as you wish. If you use your productive labor to generate new value, you get to keep that, is crucial to the economic growth of a nation. I would argue it's crucial to the economic growth of a city. And I will argue it's, in, it's very important to the growth, to revitalizing cities. In many cases, what we have in our central cities in particular is a very uncertain environment. There are actually two things. One is a very uncertain property rights environment, and it's not just eminent domain. It's also high taxation, incredibly complicated regulatory processes. I mean, thinking about uh, uh, redeveloping a warehouse, the, what was a warehouse, to loft apartments, and the kinds of hoops you have to go through to actually get that between the zoning and the building permits and all these standards you have to approach, it really is amazing. And it's no wonder people are not investing in those areas, and it's a lot easier to go to a place where there are those kinds of regulatory processes don't exist. The other thing is we need to keep in mind that there are fundamental changes in the economy. There are fundamental changes both in demographics as well as the way the nature of the economy operates. So a lot of times what we're finding is we're trying to figure out a way to retool older neighborhoods into a more modern uh, economic context, and it's not clear we are very good at guessing what that is. And so we have to be careful about that. But a secure system of property rights is going to be crucial to that. If you invest in an area, you have to be, have to be pretty certain that you're going to be able to reap the benefits of that investment, not guaranteed that you're going to get those benefits, but if they do materialize, you'll be able to get them. And that doesn't mean that some people have more property rights than others. So because you have a large developer coming in with a grand plan for revitalizing a neighborhood, that doesn't mean that their property rights should be secured by the political system and those, in the, those folks in the neighborhood are not. So I think that's a very important part of this whole thing too. So what I would like to do is, is see, see more stability in the tools that we use and, use and ones that still respect property rights. Um, so this actually gets to my view of what I think some of the practical implications of eminent domain and redevelopment are. And I've already mentioned some of them, so uh, even though I've sort of deviated from my notes, and I apologize for that because I may be meandering a little bit more than I prefer. But I think we need to recognize also that there are lots of different ways that you can facilitate the redevelopment of a neighborhood or a city. It doesn't have to be in raising a neighborhood. It does not have to be in legislatively determining which project is better than another. And in fact, I think we've undervalued the importance of redevelopment as an incremental process, particularly when we're talking about residential and, and uh, mixed-use neighborhoods and older ones and trying to get them to, uh, or trying to facilitate or encourage or, or in some way the redevelopment of those properties. And there are a number of cities where you can see where this is done block by block. It doesn't have to be neighborhood by neighborhood. And let me talk a little bit more about what I've seen happen with eminent domain, and also a little bit of truth here. I was, at, I was uh, retained by the Institute for Justice in the case in Mesa as an expert witness on urban development, and that was my first uh, experience with the legal process, and it was very interesting, to say the least. But one of the things that we, I, I saw in that case, because that was not a big project. It was a small project. It was just we're talking about a couple acres um, in the entrance to the downtown of Mesa was that in the case of Mesa, and this, I, I recognize that this uh, may be an exception, that was really the only tool, eminent domain, the seizure of the property and handing it over to a local, uh, a local hardware store operator was the only real tool that the city used. Now, I think Mesa is unique in that they're probably the only ones, in fact, this was, I think, probably the Achilles heel in that particular case, that said, we're, you know, we're, we've got loans, grants, we can do that, but we're not going to do it. We're just going to let you seize the property. In fact, Bailey, the, the, the property owner who owned a brake service, um, actually approached the developer and said, look, can we figure out a way that we can get my, comp my business incorporated into your redevelopment plan? They sent them to the city because the city was handling the condemnations. So that, and I'm increasingly skeptical of observations that this is an isolated case. Um, for a long time, I was willing to do that. But when I, when I had a, a contributor to one of the organizations I, I uh, worked for who uh, talked about how when his manufacturing plant was, wanted to expand and they were looking around for properties, they found this great plant that, had been abandoned, that hadn't been used for three or four years. So they approached the property owner and said, we'd like to buy the plant so we can expand our manufacturing facility. And the, the man refused. 
He said, well, we just went to the city, had the city condemn it, and then have the city sell it to us. At the, essentially saying, because the other property owner was selling at a too high a price, he didn't like it, he was going to use the city to get it for the price he wanted, circumventing the market. And when I have my local, and then again, this is a spontaneous um, comment, when one of the key officials of my local park district says, well, we were in negotiation for land, and the landowner first was open to it, but then decided he wanted to sell, then say, in an offhand way, we'll just use eminent domain to take the property so we can use it for the park, I begin to think that this is a little bit broader. And I do put stock in the, the Institute for Justice's statistics. When they talk about 10,282 cases, it's not just the ones that actually go to, to the to, um, it's not just the cases that actually go to court. It's also the fact that many cities use the threat of eminent domain to compel the, the sale of property. And that is pretty, pretty significant. I mean, imagine having, I mean, most people do not have the where, wherewithal or the legal knowledge to, un oh, I'm sorry, um, legal knowledge to be able to evaluate their own situation, and they often sell regardless. And uh, my time is up, so I'm going to have to, uh, unfortunately, uh, should have been watching the cards a little bit closer, um, there, um, uh, but there are things that I think we can do, but mainly it's ensuring that there's accountability in the process of using eminent domain. So I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I, I come at this topic uh, not as an attorney but as a, an urban analyst and um, mainly housing. That's been my profession, housing, housing studies, um, and somewhat of a social analyst. Um, context, somewhat in the theme of uh, some of Jeffrey's uh, comments. In the big picture, I mean big picture and in the long term, and I mean decades, but in the big picture in the long term, and by the way, decades, we, we've gone through, as we've said, 50, 60 years already of intense urban decline in American cities. And so we can think about the next 50 years as well. In the big picture in the long term, whether or not eminent domain can be used for economic development probably won't matter for many big cities and a growing number of suburbs. And in cities such as Cleveland and St. Louis, Philadelphia, mentioned Buffalo, Detroit, Rochester, and suburbs, uh, local suburbs like, say, Euclid, Maple Heights, Parma, they are being undermined by massive forces over which they have no control. And I think it begins in our society. Uh, it's a very distinctive American feature that we have. We treat buildings the same way we treat refrigerators and automobiles. Uh, we build them, uh, we use them, we use the life out of them, and then we junk them. And buildings and cities are expendable, absolutely expendable. In the case of a city, it simply just takes a lot longer to go through it than it does a refrigerator or a car. The average life of a real estate, of a residential property in the U.S. thus far is about 100 years. So we go through a car in 10 to 15 years, but on average thus far, it's about 100 years, make it 150 years. So it simply takes 10 times longer to go through residential real estate than it does automobiles. And we do it because we have ingrained a, a dominant pattern referred to already, which is uh, we are constantly building new real estate because we have to provide new in the same way we have to provide automobiles, new ones. We have to provide new real estate, particularly where there's growth occurring, and there's not much growth in the Midwest, but nonetheless, we're still building new. And we build it out, of course, on the green fields and the farms where it's easiest to do it. In many ways, it's more attractive for consumers. You build the new and we move away from the old. Deeply, deeply ingrained. The majority are doing that. In many regions of the country, more new housing is built than is population growth. That is very much the case here. Uh, this year, in the Cleveland region, there will be about 7,000 new homes built. The increase in the number of households in this region is going to be four or 5,000. Now, you just meditate on those two numbers. You come to the conclusion, well, what happens? There has to be 
two or 3,000 empty units of housing somewhere. And what occurs, of course, in the course of this year while this 7,000 is being built, there are tens of thousands of moves. Some people buy the new, some people buy newer. Tens of thousands moves, and at the end of the year, we wind up with two or 3,000 empty units of housing. And where are they? Don't have to be an urban analyst to figure that one out. It's going to be wherever the, the market is weakest. Where is the market weakest? It's where all kinds of negative, negative conditions exist. It's in the central city, and increasingly, it's in older suburbs. The decline, this phenomena, this practice of, of ours, has naturally reached the point, inevitably, where we are now undermining suburbs. And of course, public policy is geared to support of all this as we expand the highways, make it wider, put new interchanges in, uh, finance utilities in a way that so that the buyers of new don't have to pay the full cost, tax systems, and so forth. Another massive force undermining these older places, home rule. Independence of local government, it is a grand principle. It is grand until you are stuck with old real estate. Because at that point, old home rule says, nobody else has any responsibility for that old real estate other than the place that has it. Does any suburb around here have any responsibility to the city of Cleveland for its condition? Nope. Does any suburb have any responsibility for another suburb about its condition? None whatsoever. That's the downside of home rule. Glorious, as long as you're growing and new. But after 100 years, you don't want to be there. You are alone in your responsibility. Communities are left, therefore, already documented increasingly with real estate that they can't, they can't do anything with. It doesn't fit in the marketplace any longer. It takes $200,000 to recycle, on average, an acre of the city of Cleveland. You can go out 15 miles from here and buy an acre for at least 50000 Why, if you are a developer and investor, would you ever bother with an old place? And the majority of them don't. That's why government cannot get out of the way. If Cleveland did nothing, absolutely nothing, over 50 years, we'd watch more. We'd watch the city completely empty. Detroit. The reason Detroit, uh, in simple terms, goes the way it goes is because the oversupply of housing in greater Detroit region is, is, is more extreme than Cleveland. Buffalo. Four homes are built in the Buffalo region for every single household. There is no way in hell Buffalo can survive. And Detroit will not either. And neither can Cleveland. Winners and losers constantly creating new value out somewhere, and government is promoting it, leaving the losers to fend for the best as they can. Declining jurisdictions are pressured to select, sorry, to resort to eminent domain by the constant extension, expansion of new outer suburban real estate, which weakens the tax base of the old places, by economic change, global change now, which takes industrial activities to other parts of the world, and by our society's use of home rule as an excuse to avoid responsibility for old places that need redevelopment. As a society, we have no responsibility. It's their problem. 225 years ago, when our founding fathers, and I'm sure there were some mothers involved, were thrashing out the principles upon which our government would be structured, no one, I suspect, gave a blick of thought of how the communities that would be built in America would be maintained. It would have been a totally meaningless consideration. But here we are, stuck with, increasingly, communities that cannot be maintained. The singular emphasis was given to individual freedoms, understandably, fighting the king of England. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is all about the individual. Thus, in that framework, the state exists to preserve freedom, of course. But what about the preservation of a neighborhood, a town, a city? There is no bill of rights for a city, a town, a place. And because of primacy of the individual, it's very difficult for Americans to come to terms with necessary trade-offs between individual and community. Europeans, even Canadians, do it a lot more readily. We struggle over it, understandably, because we got set in that course to begin with. One thing is clear. 
growing numbers, very large numbers of homes, commercial, and industrial buildings in thousands of jurisdictions across the country, large and small, are deteriorating and are on their way to being junked. And what is our society's advice to people in those places, the mainstream advice? You don't like it? Move. Get out. Move to a better place. Alternatives to eminent domain? Well, be a San Francisco. Have so much economic growth and pressure that you don't have to worry about it virtually because it'll just happen. San Francisco doesn't have to worry about its tax base. Atlanta, Phoenix. Around here, we have to wait for the Colorado River to run dry because when that happens, <laughs> when that happens, growth in the Great Lakes will be something that we will not look forward to. Tax base sharing, there is a solution. Minneapolis, St. Paul, marvelous. How did it ever happen there? But there, there is a community right, a wide responsibility for the future of older places where tax, where new real estate, commercial and industrial, tax revenues are shared with the older places to enable them to deal with the problems they are faced in having to recycle their real estate. No other place in the country will do that. It probably isn't going to happen elsewhere because of the intense protectiveness that home rule fosters. Consolidation of governments, well, it's remarkable that a year or two ago, Louisville and its home, Jefferson County, merged into one jurisdiction. That's again, what is it? It's a sharing of tax base. That's about the only place, well, there are others, Marion County and Indianapolis, uh, Buffalo and, and Erie. You have to be desperate. A, 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 the, the, there has to be absolute desperation to produce change. And Erie and Buffalo are, are close to that. And I suppose in another 10 or so years, we will be at that point in Cleveland because we cannot stop the outer development pu pulling economic strength outward. Growth management, another solution, uh, if imp implemented properly. Uh, Oregon has done it, uh, but that violates property rights, so we'll see none of that elsewhere. So in conclusion, we have, we have a social, governmental, legal framework that is firmly established, and it stacks the deck heavily against places that are no longer new, that are built out, they have no farms, and they have real estate is slipping in market demand. As a consequence, we will see a steady decade after decade erosion and then collapse of suburban jurisdictions as they age into the late decades, 70s, 80s, 90, 100 years old, following the path of the big cities. And we as Americans are willing to live with that because the solution is, if you don't like it, just move further out. Eminent domain for economic development would help, but in many places, if not most, it will make very little differences. Our society considers neighborhoods, towns, and cities to be expendable. Before we go to uh, questions from the audience, I didn't know if, if panelists uh, wanted to respond to comments from other panelists. Sorry about that. Um, and in addition, uh, people that are watching the webcast can email questions uh, to jha5 at case.edu, uh, and and I will uh, share them with the uh, with the panelists. Um, since I was first up, I just the one comment I would make is I think one thing that this panel highlights is that the real difference in the debate over eminent domain is, the, is a difference in belief in how one achieves economic growth. And whether or not one believes economic growth is primarily to be achieved by government agencies, political entities, and planners in a top-down way planning for economic development or whether or not it's primarily go going to be achieved through a bottom-up and organic process of entrepreneurship, small bu business development, and neighborhood revitalization that results from myriad small individual choices that in aggregation uh, produce economic revitalization. Uh, there are certainly examples of each. Uh, there are also certainly examples of each failing to happen. Uh, but I think, as, as Sam mentioned, uh, a lot of folks, uh, certainly in the ec economic literature, are moving towards uh, the point of view that the underlying institutions, the underlying uh, rule of law, property rights, and contract rules and the like, are more important for economic growth and development than actions by government agencies to plan and focus on big projects. 
So I, just the, the one comment I would make is I certainly agree with Jeff that there are many large projects that will not happen without eminent domain. And some percentage of those projects will be successful. But ex ante, we don't know which projects those are. And we have a lot of reason to believe that focusing on those sorts of projects comes at the expense of focusing on other sorts of policy measures which could produce greater results. And again, in terms of areas like Ohio, I think we can talk a lot about the various pressures that, that make it difficult for cities like Cleveland and make it difficult for states like Ohio. Uh, but I'll re repeat the statistic I mentioned before. The state of Ohio has the third highest combined state and local tax burden in the nation. So if you are mobile, if you are a mobile entrepreneur or a small business owner or a professional or highly educated individual, the sort of person that's going to help produce uh, uh, and, and lead to job creation and, and business formation, unless you have family reasons or sentimental reasons for being here or staying here, you're not going to. And you're going to go somewhere uh, where, where there's a more favorable economic climate. And those sorts of policy decisions have a big effect on economic development, and at least I would suggest that they have a larger uh, uh, impact than uh, whether or not we have large development projects uh, such as uh, the sorts that are often talked about in the eminent domain context. That was the one response I had. I didn't know if other panelists wanted to respond yeah. to. Jonathan, I, I think I would uh, want to respond immediately <coughs> to your characterization of uh, that, uh, that, that the dichotomy on this panel was one between uh, big government and entrepreneurship, which was your initial response there. And I think those of us in economic development uh, would argue that 99% uh, of all economic activity occurs without government, and that's best. Um, but that there are deals that could not go forward uh, without uh, some type of uh, government assistance, government intervention. So I don't see that as a, uh, as a, as a top-down, a planner-driven uh, approach. That uh, in, And Sam talked about uh, the fact that uh, Detroit didn't turn around as a result of of the investment of, of General Motors. I think in order for us to turn around these communities, it's going to take lots and lots of investment, it, and and it needs to be done by entrepreneurships. It means it needs to be taken by developers who take risk, and it needs to be, um, I wouldn't disagree with you at all, that the regulatory environment for many communities is such that they dr drive out investment. But you, our large, um, our, our large automobile plants don't happen uh, without some type of government assistance. Our large uh, airline maintenance facilities do not uh, come about because without government assistance. Uh, our large steel plants do not come about uh, uh, without government assistance, and that assistance comes both in terms of tax breaks and use, uh, judicious use of eminent domain. But that has far more to do with tax structure than it does anything else. Well, I think. Um, again, for me, the, the issue here, well, the issue for me, and I, I agree that, in my, well, a couple things. One is a lot of these big projects don't come about without government assistance. I think that's true, but it's also not clear to me in many of those cases you, that government assistance is crucial for that project to come about. Um, but that's another issue. That's another panel probably of an entire conference um, in and of itself. But I think Parceling out the different tools that are available for economic development, I think, is important in understanding that there are uh, that there are some tools that just ought to be used very sparingly. And again, you know, one of the things that Jeff is pointing out: if it is a tool of last resort, why are we seeing it applied in cases which really seem to really stretch the limits um, of what can be considered blight, for example? I mean, in my view, in uh, Lakewood, you can argue is a, is an interesting case. But is what is essentially dislocating several thousand people out of the, the West End neighborhood really going to build a stronger and more healthy Lakewood um, with the replacement of the Lifestyle Center complex? I have serious doubts because I think what uh, I would much rather see the city of Lakewood trying to, to establish a stronger, more co cohesive neighborhood than trying to replace it with something in that case. And also, I mean, simply you have a system, or I mean, a system. Uh, Maybe that's not the best way to, uh, to characterize it, but you have a policy environment that is, gives enough discretion to local governments that they could even condemn the West End on blight criteria, I think is problematic. 
because my assessment of property values and the nature of that neighborhood as well as some other folks is that it doesn't fit most criteria of what blight are. So maybe, the, I mean, one solution here on my end is to begin to really provide some accountability and some narrowness to the use of the tool um, to the point where these kinds of things don't happen. But I've seen enough of it happen often enough that it really raises serious questions for me. I, I don't know if the audience knows about the Lakewood case. Uh, it was featured on 60 Minutes. Uh, you can get the uh, transcript of both the Mesa case and the Lakewood case uh, going to the 60 Minutes website. But I, I see Lakewood as not a disaster because it didn't happen. So to raise a case where the eminent domain never occurred, where uh, the public reaction was such uh, that many of the city council members are gone, that uh, the eminent domain did not occur, says we don't have to race to the courts every time one of these happen or that there's a threat of eminent domain. It says that there is some public accountability and, and, and many of the city council members in Lakewood actually paid the ultimate, ultimate uh, accountability. They're no longer in office. So I view that as a victory towards the process that we have in place versus uh, some desire to race off to the federal courts to try to uh, uh, get somebody else to rule where it got handled locally just, just perfectly. Um, if the reason the Lakewood case did not go through was because there was enough of a grassroots opposition that it went to the ballot box and people voted it down. I think if we consider that a victory, then essentially we're saying that property rights are really up to whether or not we can muster grassroots support and, let, and achieve a political victory at the ballot box. There are no real property rights in that case. That essentially means our ability to own a home or a business is subject to the political environment in which we happen to live. So I don't think that's a victory. I think, in fact, if anything, it sort of demonstrates the, uh, the nature of the problem we face and the problematic nature of eminent domain and how it's been incorporated into economic development policy. So um, just the fact it didn't go through is not, it's the, we have to be concerned about the way these decisions are made. Um, Tom, did you want to add anything? I, being here, I was close to the Lakewood situation. Um, I mean, the state of Ohio says you can't do these things unless you define blight, so they did the best they could to define blight, you know, and it, it was a bit hokey, I admit to that, but um, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, 15 miles out from Lakewood is, is thousands and thousands of square miles of farmland. And over the next 50 years, uh, even 25 years, I mean, th this project that Lakewood attempted would no way would that save that town because a third of the real estate in Lakewood is dead. It's, it's being mined. You know, the slum lords are moving in. The scumbags are there. And, it, you know, it's just rent it, you know, and milk it dry. And how's, how does Lakewood deal with that? And the, the, the eminent domain in that respect is point. I mean, they're desperate. You know, you cut through to the heart of them. I mean, you've got city after city now, suburb. After, they're desperate because they know they're collapsing. They're dying. And there's nothing, really nothing, that they can do to save themselves. It's our system that says it's your problem, goodbye. That's the problem. And we can't cope with that. As a society, we can't cope with that. We just simply move. Lakewood, goodbye. Questions for the panelists? If folks would just wait for the microphone to come so we can catch the question on the webcast. Um, thank you all for, for, uh, for coming. I think one of the things that hasn't been mentioned too much, and this is sort of off the eminent domain topic, is uh, you gave the impression that, that people uh, live in a home and after 100 years or 10 years throw it away. I, I, I think it's much more complex than that. I think the reason people leave, my, my maternal grandfather lived on Yako in Buckeye in the Hungarian neighborhood. Uh, I, about 10 or 15 years ago, I read a newspaper article. In the very house that my grandfather grew up in, there was an invasion of a drug lord or something, you know. And then we took the kids there to see it once, and literally the street was covered with broken glass. I mean, is there any wonder that, that people would leave? And, and look, take a look at Little Italy. I mean, that's a community that has kept itself together. There are homes there that are well over 100 years old uh, because they've kept together some sort of uh, 
of a community spirit, some sort of community norms that allow people to stay there. And I think there's that, that it's not so much a throwaway attitude, I think it's a self-preservation attitude in terms of the, of the cities and so on. And until we deal with the welfare and the uh, single parent, single mother, not single parent, single mother homes and so on, and the decline of marriage and such, I think you're going to have this, this problem. I think if those forces are changed, it's not so much economic. I agree with you completely. The problems that Lakewood face are much, much more different than economic. So I, I, I just would wonder your thoughts on these more basic questions that, you know, it was kind of, it's somewhat chilling, a little frightening for people to say, well, I get this sense that there's something evil because I want to live in a neighborhood uh, that's better than, than, than the ones that are in Lakewood or, or the inner city of Cleveland. And I find that chilling. Uh, a little make, it, it troubles me. Well, well, no one is evil in that, and you're quite right. I mean, the, the negative conditions that have uh, multiplied and festered over the last 50, 60 years in urban cores, of course, there aren't many people who, who want to live there. But increasingly, there are those, some who do, you know. So there are, there are islands of recovery. You know, but the interesting thing is you take this, we're talking about urban, classic urban problems. Why is it that half of everybody who sells a home in the outer, from the, living in the outer edges of this county, grand, grand superior <coughs> suburban, why is it that half of them move farther out to buy their next home? What, what, what crime is pushing them? What pathetic school system is pushing them? They're moving from a... $280,000 home to a $400,000 home. And on and on. It's, it's, I mean, nobody in the central city would move until the suburbanites can't move, until they moved. It's the suburbanites moving first. Going deeper into the countryside. And the countryside is being built for them. It's not just a city thing. It is essentially we middle class folks primarily going outward and turning over our real estate to those who have a little less income. And over time, it winds up to be low income. In the future, you know, think of this. America is, all, is the only place where the poor live in the centers of the cities. You go everywhere in the world and it's not that way. We are going to turn it around. The poor are going to go out. It's going to take another 100 years, and the sitter will be occupied by the middle and upper class. We got screwed up in this country 100 years ago. Now it's taken another 100 years to get the thing twisted around. But there, there will be suburbs all over that are going to be the ghettos of poor in another 50 or 100 years. There's a, a question from upstairs uh, uh, for Jeff. Uh, it says, if many people are happy to have their property taken with eminent domain, why is eminent domain necessary in, in the first place? I guess the question being that if there are lots of examples of communities being willing sellers uh, or, or being happy to have their, their land taken, then presumably they'd be willing sellers. And I guess a related question would be, isn't the use of eminent domain usually not where the real estate is dead, but, but as a preemptive measure before it's dead? Because presumably once the real estate's dead and abandoned, it, it would be relatively easy uh, to obtain, but that it's, it's the it's where eminent domain is used as a preventative measure where it becomes more of an issue because that's where you're more likely to have landowners that are unwilling to sell. Um, I, I, would disagree, I, I would disagree that, um, that you, we can only use or the, the use of eminent domain is only in the case where the land is dead because you still have some, uh, a number of complicated situations that prevent easy sales. Uh, sometimes it's difficult uh, to find the owner. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the community will use a quick take provision of some sort to acquire the land as, as rapidly as possible. Uh, some land is tied up in, in unique types of trusts uh, or are a part of a process where uh, somebody has left the land behind and uh, families are fighting over that particular piece, uh, parcel of property. Um, so even in the most dire of conditions, and I, one would merely have to look at Pole Town, uh, a lot of that land was dead, and they still had to use eminent domain in order to uh, take some of the parcels of that property. Uh, so I, I would disagree with the premise. Uh, the, the second, uh, 
eminent domain is uh, used in, in cases where the, the land is still alive, and, uh, and we, I gave some of those examples in the cases that, that I provided. Um, at the end of the day, it is still a tool of last resort. It is still a tool that you would prefer to do negotiated sale always before you used eminent domain, and, and I think at the end of the day, that is what goes on in most of the deals before we get there. Additional questions? There's a question here. I want to return to uh, Lakewood. This is Ohio, not Colorado, and despite Tom's uh, pretty pessimistic view of the future of the Lakewoods of the world, uh, I want to talk about the, the vote, which was mentioned in passing. Uh, for people who are not familiar, despite uh, a very sympathetic portrayal of the holdouts, residential owners, and despite the uh, 60 Minutes treatment of the former mayor now defeated, uh, it was about a 50-50 split it passed by, that is the rejection of the redevelopment plan and the use of eminent domain by as I recall, 47 votes. So thinking red state, blue state, it seems to me we have lots of examples around the country where people are pretty divided about the use when it's put to a vote. And despite the property rights movement attempt in several states to pass takings legislation to make it virtually automatic, they've been rejected in many places, although I would um, look to Oregon, which uh, in November did pass a measure that may put a serious crimp in land use planning and growth management out there. But I think we ought to think about um, public opinion, and I'm not sure despite implications that Americans are against the use of eminent domain, it's a um, violation of the property rights. The Lakewood example, I think, with people concerned about the future of the city, produced a very split, divided, right down the middle opinion. Does anyone want to comment on that? or Additional questions? Let me just make a comment. Um, Having refocused on the eminent domain debate in light of the Hathcock case in Michigan, um, I, I've been surprised, and I know Sam referred to it, that uh, the, uh, th those who, who support uh, setting aside economic development as a proper basis for the use of eminent domain frequently say that uh, Pole Town didn't turn the city of Detroit around. Now, I don't know of one person connected with that who ever suggested the Pole Town project would turn the city around. Hmm. The city is 137.8 square miles. Pole Town is 400 acres. At the time, the city was in decline in a broad section. At least a third of the city was in significant decline. And uh, right now, it has 40,000 vacant parcels of land under city ownership from tax reversion, and about 50 square miles. If it were, if you accumulated all of the vacant land, but it's all pockmarked with some some forms of small development exist. Uh, the problem for Detroit was that that was viewed as a, an attempt at a strategy to begin to try to keep and, ex and, uh, and expand the uh, de declining manufacturing base. Uh, it was the, the same project was done one more time for the Chrysler Corporation, same size plant. But then there were no other, no other takers. There was no other major industrial company that would be willing to participate. I don't see the, the distinction between using eminent domain to uh, assemble land for industrial and commercial purposes and saving neighborhoods. There are a lot, there's a lots of activity ongoing in Detroit to attempt to save neighborhoods by infilling it with affordable housing to try to assemble sm tracks and rebuild for market rate housing. I, I don't see it as an either or. I see it both as part of a big strategy. To me, if, if you're in an outlying area, such as an uh, exurban or suburban area, Hathcock would be an example, where there is a hot market, then general economic <coughs> development will occur whether or not you use eminent domain. If it doesn't occur this year, it'll occur next. Because the market is hot, there'll be constant pressure on the landowners to sell. There'll be a constant increase in the offers. Different projects will come along. It won't be today's project, but tomorrow's project might be just as desirable. But if you're in an area where there's no market, such as a distressed inner city area, and you have to cultivate the market, that's when you need to, to make it easy and to help assemble the land. So I, I, that distinction to me has to be drawn. The, the heat of the market. Is there a market there, or does it have to be enticed and, and cultivated? Uh, those are my comments. I, I think there, uh, there's a point that wasn't really hit on in the earlier panel and hasn't been hit on here, but I think one of the things that distinguishes folks like myself who, are, who really want to restrain the use of eminent domain, make it very limited, versus those that are 
more interested or, or really look at it as just simple as, as another tool that ought to be used to further a, a goal is that for folks like myself I look at property rights as a civil right I think as, as a right my right to own property to dispose of that property as I see fit to use that property productively and to reap the rewards or that in some cases there there'll be uh, there'll be losses of some sort that that is something that ought to be protected and it's fundamental to the governance of the United States but I think it's also fundamental to the way the economy works a market economy works and to the extent that we take away that or we redefine it so that it's not it's something that is actually a right that we have that is uh, really at the discretion of the local government um, to own that property and run that business as we see fit that that and that that becomes a problem because I, I see it as, a, as much more fundamental than the, uh, I see the property right as much more fundamental and as something that needs to be protected. And the Constitution does protect it, but it protects it through just compensation. And it, it, uh, what it does is it protects the civil rights of everybody else so that the government can acquire necessary land to create economic activity so that you can support your police and fire and, and you can make neighborhoods better for everybody, not just uh, um, for the Baileys of the world who was running a break shop who uh, you know, uh, made that neighborhood look awful. Yeah, I, going back to the, uh, you know, the Gibbings issue, I mean, it's, I've always been perplexed. We, we've just had a widening of an interstate here, I-71, which is the road that heads down to Columbus as it goes out of this county into the next county and a, an improvement of the major interchange there that goes to Medina. That action has created greater wealth for property owners in the vicinity of that happening. And in so doing, it's taking property value away from the back in the, the weaker end of the market, the other end of I-71, which happens to end here in downtown Cleveland. Why is that not a justice issue? Why is that not a justice issue? Why should government make property owners out there gain handsomely and at the same time take value away from others? Why do we permit that? Please, somebody answer that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the, the traditional answer would be that, that government has the ability to take all sorts of actions that affect property values but that the only time it's, an, it's at least a legal constitutional issue, it doesn't mean there aren't questions of, 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 of moral questions or questions of justice, is if a stick from the bundle is taken. And so, for example, in the, in the regulatory takings debate, uh, one, one misconception that's often made by individuals on both sides of that debate, and you, those that call for compensation and those that oppose compensation, is the claim that the, the determination of whether or not a taking has occurred is a change in land value when in fact the, 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 the determination that is supposed to occur is whether or not a stick in the underlying bundle of rights that, that uh, are, are connected to a property has been taken. And so all sorts of actions, both government and private, may, may have effects that we consider to be just or unjust. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that there has been a legal question. And I, just, I would just also add, I think, you know, I would certainly, or certainly have sympathy for Jeff's point that not every uh, poor policy decisions should result in someone rushing to court. And, and, and I certainly have mixed views on, on the constitutional question uh, in this debate. I think though th that setting that aside, one can still recognize first, this is a practical matter, uh, in Lakewood had lo a lawsuit not been filed, um, there would not have been near as much attention to the case it w and it wouldn't have received the public attention that resulted in, 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 in the referendum and so on. Uh, and that's often true and, and, and that's been true of groups of all sorts of political persuasions that have re realized that litigation can be used as a way of focusing public attention on a controversy that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't receive it. But that secondly, w one has to wonder, and I, and I would certainly argue given the details of that case, how is it that we got to the, to the point where individuals thought they could, uh, they could use a blight designation to target one community when the majority of all the houses in the entire city, uh, including the mayor's own, w would fit that designation but were not classified as blighted. And despite the, 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 the large number of, for example, open storefronts, uh, the belief was that we needed to, to, to take the property that was most desirable to developers because of its view. And that to even get to that point where litigation and or a referenda would be necessary, 
would seem to suggest that the, the political priorities, the policy priorities outside of the courtroom might not be uh, 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 might, might not be properly aligned, that even if eminent domain is a tool that needs to be part of the policy mix, as Sam suggested, maybe we have allowed it to get to, to rise too high uh, in the list of tools or in the priority of tools uh, such that policymakers think that they can they can resort to it because it often is easier and less time consuming and less troublesome than negotiating or or, 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 or trying to find other ways of putting together. But, but together Jonathan, thoughts. how many cities are in Ohio? Two hundred and thirty-eight. Well, <laughs> of of five thousand or more, the definition is five thousand yeah, or more. Two hundred and thirty, about maybe the two hundred and thirty. So less than a third have done an eminent domain action in the last uh, ten years, and so that is a policy option that that cities are rushing to use. I don't think so. I mean, I can I can go take you to dozens of cities. Uh, whose elected officials would argue that they would never use eminent domain for taking housing. Uh, they will sometimes use it for commercial taking and industrial taking, but they will not use it for housing. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a hard time coming to some conclusion that says that uh, this is an option of first choice or, or that this is a policy option people are just jumping on. Yeah, a couple of things on this. Um, remember that the numbers that we're referring to from the Institute for Justice compiled are from 1998 to 2002, if I remember right. So it's not looking at the, at the history of that. Second of all, I think an important point here is also that cities will use eminent domain when they find it's in their, when they feel it's in their best interest to use it. And if you're in a growing housing market and you have vacant land, which a lot of these cities these do, that's usually not an issue that comes up. So typically what you will find this being used is either in the attraction or trying to get industrial commercial sites or in the revitalization of inner city neighborhoods. Um, but I, if, if I could, I'd like to go back to some, one of the things Tom talked about in terms of the justice issue because I think that's a very important point. And I think there are two issues I'd like to at least put on the table for people to think about, but in using an economic and a public choice perspective. If the intent we used, the, and the, the example was the interchange, the I-71 interchange, and it creates value um, for some people and it takes away from value from the others. And the question is, why, where's, the, where's the question about the justice? If the intent of the interchange was, in fact, explicitly to generate that value at that interchange, I think there really ought to be a serious question about justice because what you're doing is you are, are using a public policy to redistribute the benefits or of in that case. But if it was justified based on a broader, what, what a typically economists would consider a public good in terms of improving circulation, reducing congestion, providing better connectivity and mobility, then that is typically something that would be justified as a legitimate use of, government, of the government's powers to provide a public good. And at that point, the creation of the value is itself a consequence of the decision, but it's not a primary purpose. And so the, as an incidental effect, it wouldn't necessarily raise the ire of justice. The other point, though, which also is relevant, is I think, from, at least from an economic perspective, is that we, we shouldn't confuse the, the actual value of property as being, a, 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 or that people have a right to a certain value of property. The value, the, when we talk about the land price, that's a metric. It's a way of measuring value. But what we have, really, when we talk about property rights, it's not the right to my house, which is valued at 80000 It's the right to own, use, and use that property as I see fit, as long as it doesn't significantly or negatively affect other, other folks. So I just wanted to put those two things out on the table. But, just kind of, but there's a quite, uh, metric. There's a, a matter of dif, 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 distance here. That new interchange out there at... at um, I-71 and, and Route 18 is 12 miles, 15 miles from inner Cleveland neighborhoods. The distance there uh, disguises the relationship between the, the growth in value in one place and the loss of value uh, further back in. But if, you know, if, if somehow that happened right, if something were done right next door to a property to diminish my value, you do something next door to mine and diminish my value. Don't I have a case? 
it depends on the on the nature of what you've done and and uh, whether or not there's some way that I if, if in fact you have done something that I can I can show as clearly negatively affected my value it's certainly something that could be uh, well, litigated I, as a tort I think that's the issue so I think the distance the, litigation. the scale of these dynamics disguise what actually is happening which make it which well, makes it then possible for all of us to live with it right, well well, on, on the other hand, though, the nature of any economy, whether it's centrally directed or it's market-driven, you have changes in value, economic and cultural and other value, all the time. It's just the nature of the evolution of neighborhoods, it's the evolution of cities, uh, it, and any time you have innovation that is productive and creates value in one part of a geographic area, that is going to be a magnet for new value to be created in, in movement, and it's going to, in, if it's a zero-sum game, as you've set it up, then you're going to have negative value someplace else. The, the question is, the, the key, and I think this is what the goal of economic development policy ought to be, is growing the pie, not redistributing the existing wealth. And that is, that's, the, that's the core issue. Because um, okay. then you can have that interchange, but you can also be able to maintain or hopefully improve value in other parts of the city. Be a San Francisco. That's the, that's I, well, I'm not as cynical as you are, Tom. <laughs> Get some other questions from the audience right here in the middle. My question is for Mr. Finkel. In reality, isn't it true that the developers and that the other parties who are big proponents of the use of eminent domain are the same parties that are against the use of regulation and really, and to some degree, the power to tax, which are the other powers we discuss, uh, don't, don't give us onerous uh, restrictions on how we can develop the land. Don't give us a heavy tax burden because that will inhibit development. But we want to use your power to get that piece that we need from that guy who won't come to the table. And we can discard the, the, the notion that threatened eminent domain plays a role. But isn't it true that the bigger the threat, that the government might come and take it and give it to me for X number of dollars, the easier it's going to be for me to negotiate you down to that number? You know, I wish it were as easy as you just said, because that would have made the politics of putting together um, uh, amicus briefs for uh, this case that much easier. But remember, the National Association of Home Builders and National Association of Realtors filed against us um, uh, in supporting New London uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Kilo case. So um, we, um, I've been working on uh, this eminent domain issue for a long time, and um, the Urban Land Institute, which is the 6,000-pound gorilla developers, the Real Estate Roundtable, um, they actually, I think they call them, uh, the, uh, used to be called the National Realty Committee, the International Council of Shopping Centers, we could not get them to file uh, briefs on our behalf uh, to support what New London did in the Kilo case. So um, they are as divided as in terms of uh, eminent domain because they sometimes are with you, as you mentioned, but they're sometimes uh, actually losing land. Uh, in, in a, in a taking, takings case, or they have this, you know, free market notion that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, they, they, that gets them bollocked up. Um, so at the end of the day, the persons that actually benefit the most from eminent domain, in my opinion, are the taxpayers of the communities where you're using it, because you're trying to achieve some higher good. Um, I, th I would agree with all your other comments in terms of what the uh, developers want out of a city. They want less regulation. They want, uh, you know, an incentive where they can get it. But they were not in lockstep with us in uh, on, on the Kilo case in, in New London. Questions, uh, Tim. Tim Sander from the, from the Pacific Legal Foundation. I have two quick questions for Dr. Beer. First of all, you mentioned that it was it cost two hundred thousand dollars to uh, redevelop an acre of land in Cleveland. What fraction of that price, if any, is due to regulatory or tax burdens? Uh, and secondly, if people, you know, I'm from Northern California, so when you speak about San Francisco, there's a lot of envy in your voice. If people want to move out of Ohio and come to San Francisco, what's wrong with that? Why should we use the state to steal people's homes in order to force them to stay in communities where they would prefer not to live? Well, of course not. Don't, can't do that. I mean, I wouldn't want to. Um, and the 200000 I mean, that's basically the cost of what you, the demolition. There's almost always demolition involved, uh, environmental testing, 
and usually uh, dealing with the foundations of buildings that already were demolished 30, 40, 50 years ago. So on average, that's the cost. Taxes on it is just, is, if it's delinquent, uh, it's already gone, probably being dealt with and going into a land bank. Includes the in environmental costs. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, but the, the, we had one General Motors plant that was recycled here. Uh, cost 700,000 an acre to recycle that land. Just, just getting the land ready for recycling, I should say. So it's an average of 200. Tom, is it your fear that the uh, establishment of uh, broad corridors of commuter rail north and south and east to west across Ohio will also contribute to the same degradation of the big cities to the burbs as far as property values? Wherever there is more housing built than there is growth, there will be degradation of real estate somewhere, of housing somewhere. And we are greatly, over, in, a, in that sense, oversupplying in most of the Midwest. So in Cleveland here, absolutely. And, and so uh, you know, any transportation that facilitates uh, the development farther out is just going to add to it. And I, I'm, I'm not saying myself that that shouldn't happen. This is our country. This is how we operate. And it's based on, it's all shaped by the principles that we've been discussing here primarily. And that's how we, why we differ from Europe and we differ from Canada and other places. This is us. Therefore, we just, but we just have to accept the consequences. A, a question for, for Sam related to uh, 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 Tim's question. If, if the cost in a place like Cleveland, due to brownfield problems, due to um, the nature of, of prior industrial construction, and you know, if one, one takes the RTA, I was talking with one of my colleagues last night, from Shaker to downtown, one sees tons of abandoned land, uh, large acre lots that could be redeveloped, but as Tom mentioned, it's very expensive to redevelop. What is your view of using public resources to subsidize uh, the redevelopment uh, of, those, of those lands uh, and to prepare them for alternative uses if the, if the costs are that high? That's uh, one of the few cases where I think there is scope for um, the public to be involved, particularly in the cases of environmental um, remediation of many of those sites. Um, and again, it's, it goes back to the nature of, of the problem as it emerged and the fact that there are some what we call in economics externalities that have to be dealt with. And many of these costs were not incorporated as they should have been um, years before, and essentially the, the city or is left holding, uh, or uh, some cases, a property owner, but remediation of those sites is very, very difficult. And so I think there is a, there is a role for local governments to somehow remedi help remediate those sites to bring them back up to standards, particularly in the area of brownfields. Um, it's both a, a practical one as well as a principled one, I think. We have time for one more question. Yeah, th this is to Sam. When, when he was up talking, you said you had a number of alternatives other than uh, eminent domain uh, to, to work out some of these problems for redevelopment or economic development. And I've been kind of waiting for you to say this. So could you give us a couple of those alternatives? Yeah, um, actually, um, there are actually two questions. And I'll try to be brief because uh, not only are we out of time, but I know I'm going to give Jeff heartburn here in a minute. Um, there, there are two things. One is I think that we can, there are a number of alternatives in terms of regular economic development, public policy things that you can do to, to improve the likelihood of a reinvestment and redevelopment. And I think we really underestimate the, regu the, the effects that regulation have on incentives to invest, particularly in neighborhoods, particularly when we're talking about planning, rezoning, redevelopment, that type of thing. The uncertainties that are in that process are are really, really significant, and it creates a pretty substantial um, barrier. But there are other things. I mean, loans, grants, tax abatements. Those are there's a, there's really a menu. In fact, you can go to a, you know any tech, economic development textbook, and they'll list some of those. And those are all things that I think would be preferable to going to first before you go to eminent domain. The other thing, though, which is what I was I was referring to is I think there are ways that we need through probably statute, because it looks like the courts won't do it, is to narrow the use of eminent domain. So in fact, people like me can have confidence when Jeff Finkel says that this is a tool of last resort. And some of those things are I think that we need to limit to holdouts. I think we need to uh, have criteria, real blight criteria, not the fact that you are, you know, your houses are just not as expensive as, the, as others in the neighborhood. Um, I think that actually, 
uh, there has to be a public use, a clear public use component to it, that, um, and that has to be transparent. Um, and I think that other less intrusive remedies have to be exhausted. Now, there has to be clear that this is a last resort. It's just not something that's added to it, and that there's also no reasonable accommodation um, other than using eminent domain. I think that that's just a real brief list and, uh, of criteria that I think would narrow it to the point where I think we get at least people like me might be willing to be confident saying eminent domain is a last resort. Yeah. But I don't see that happening. Sam, if, if I thought there were some real alternatives there, I might be in agreement with you, but I didn't hear anything that doesn't already exist. You know, uh, you know, you've, you face the same regulations all over the country in, in, in development activities. That menu of tools is already available if communities had uh, those tools and they were an alternative to eminent domain, uh, they would have used them. Um, you know, I, I don't disagree with you in limiting it to holdouts, to limiting it to blight, but as long as public use is still uh, defined as the ability to do deals that are going to allow you to have economic investment, we would probably be uh, uh, in sync, but I worry that when you start to use that word public use, you don't mean uh, to allow for, uh, uh, to allow commercial deals to, uh, to go forward, so you've offered no alternatives no. Uh, 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 to us. You are correct that my definition of public use is not public benefit, so, or for that matter, whatever the majority of the city council decides is a public use. Um, I think there have to be criteria, and I'm, unfortunately, I don't, we don't have to time to go into that, but I do, I would like to see us go back to a standard that is much more constrained, and it's not simply that you got a majority on city council to say that this is going to benefit the city, and therefore invoke the power. I think that this is where we're going to have to leave it. Um, a couple quick announcements. Uh, first, there are our box lunches in rooms A61 and A62 uh, across the hall. Uh, we will break for half an hour, so I encourage you all to grab a box lunch. You can bring it back into here to eat. We will reconvene at 1 o'clock, uh, where we will have a debate on the merits of the Kelo case um, between uh, uh, Bert Gall, who's uh, an attorney with the Institute for Justice, which is representing the homeowners, and, and Peter Byrne, who is a, a professor at Georgetown, uh, who participated in one of the amicus briefs uh, uh, on behalf of the city of New London. Uh, but before we uh, adjourn, if you please join me in, in not necessarily thanking me, but thanking my co-panelists uh, for what was a very stimulating discussion. <laughs> <laughs>